All aboard. Tickets, please. Tickets, please. The podcast is about to begin. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, I am so excited to finally announce something that has been marinating for a little bit, but... I, along with a bunch of other fun friends from Multitude, are headed to Nashville, Tennessee this June 1st and 2nd for Pod X. PodX is great because it's a podcast convention for anyone involved in podcasting. Whether you're just a fan, an aspiring podcaster, someone in the industry, it's got everything for you. And I will be a part of two multitude panels. The first is called DDR, Dungeons and Dragons in Reality. It's going to be a Dungeons and Dragons campaign, a one-shot DM'd by Eric Silver of Join the Party, where the other multitude hosts will be playing themselves to show that you can play a D&D campaign that is more grounded in reality. I'll also be a part of a panel called It's Never Too late learning, growing, and fixing mistakes after launch. So this will be us teaching you that you can figure stuff out about how to make your podcast better on the fly, and Potterless is a testament to that. Whether it was getting a new microphone, improving the website, social media, editing, software, all that kind of stuff, we'll be teaching you how you can fix your podcast after it's launched. It's okay. It's never too late. And of course, since we'll be in Nashville, we're going to do some sort of multitude meetup if you don't make it out to the convention itself. But if you want to go to this convention and you want 10% off your tickets, head on over to multitude.production slash live. It has all the information about all of this and a discount code for those tickets. And speaking of figuring stuff out on the fly, I wanted to take the time to give a shout out to Misha Stanton, previous guest and an amazing audio wizard, a mage of podcast audio production. They work on the Bright Sessions, Ars Paradoxica, Star Trooper, so many incredible podcasts. And Misha took the time to have a Skype session with me last week about how to improve the audio of Potterless. I have since downloaded some software to make it sound better, so hopefully you take note of it here. So I just wanted to give them a shout out and thank them because they did not have to do this. It was completely unprompted. They just shot me a text message and said, hey, I want to help make Potterless sound better. Let's have a Skype date. And it was so fantastic. So thanks again, Misha. And I cannot recommend the podcast that they work on enough. Speaking of thanking and recommending people, we have new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Atan, Caitlin Team Put Outer Scarfway, TT Glassel, Sarah Marsh, Morgan Howard, Greet Robbins, Helen Chapman, Meredith, Sasha, Summer Kiesel, Yamil Aliner, Sarah Serto, Pete, Scotty, Henry Garcia, Ludo Bagman, JJ Ellis, Jamie Townsend, Gemma Kay, Samantha Tupfer, Stephen Willis, Susie Hunt, Adams Viaranga, Ole Coles, and Samantha Russo. A shout out to Katie Morris and Lee Xiaoru, who upgraded their pledge, and a huge shout out to Courtney Hemwood, Kine Roan, Amanda Alfred, and Sabrina, who are producer-level patrons. They join the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Clow, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Kieran, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie, Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamel, Russell, Dustin, Audra, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rossanne, Andrea, Nikita, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Lovekesh, Ali, Cassandra, Roxy, Amelia, Sean, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Jessica, Arno, Tiago, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Steve, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Marino, Moster, Pinky, Angelina, Ross, Marie, Lee, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Finn, Mosin, Grace, Sammy, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Brianne, Alexandra, John, Jen, Noel, Tao, Emily, Michael, Robin, Patricia, Will, Liz, Mariah, Brandon. Sarah, Claire, Teal, Cena, Rory, Gloria, Sarah, Patrick, Alley, Cat, Hallie, Veronica, Kevin, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Lucinda, Carlos, Pam, Nikki, Colleen, Jennifer, Friday, Ivor, Naomi, Tyler, Summer, Heather, Vera, Kerry, Andrea, Topher, Ella, Anthony, Dead Cat Lady, David, Elisa, Lynn, Emily, Ryan, Cameron, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Mark, Polly, Kimberly, Srujan, Brittany, Nita, Bavi, Tumnus, Remy, Matt, Sarah, Lauren, Nona, Kyle, Zena, Emily, Colleen, Harlan, Akanksha, Wouter, Shelby, Noelle, Reese, Adriana, Brian, Akamib, Washin, Jenny, Nikki, Kara, Dorcas, and Can't I Potter? Who never fall asleep in a strange position on a bus or a train so that their neck hurts for the rest of the day. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, my notes, exclusive live streams, exclusive merchandise, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 72 of Potterless covering chapter 21 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, guest starring my sister, Megan Fruhoff. <laughs> So, a couple days passed in real life, and now we are on chapter 21, The Tale of the Three Brothers, where I learned that, first off, what I thought the Deathly Hallows is, is very different. I thought it was a place. Fun fact, not a place. <laughs> not also, at all a place. <laughs> not even close. And then also, I thought Xenophilius was kind of cute and charming. Nope, he's a big old narc. No, he's crazy. <laughs> so, Harry and the squad have no idea what the Deathly Hallows means, and uh, hard same from you boy. Clearly, they haven't been reading the seventh book, but it's okay because Xenophilius says few actually know what it means, and he says that the meaning of the Deathly Hallows isn't dark or evil or anything like that. 
He says that it is used by wizards to prove to others that they are fellow believers to help them with the quest to find the Deathly Hallows. Yes. And at this point, I still was like, oh, yeah, it's a place. You got to find it. (laughs) (laughs) Not them. (laughs) Yes. I think I'm realizing that I thought I don't know what the word Hallows actually means. And I think I was confusing it with the word Gallows, which I think is a place like the gallows oh. pole is like okay. a, a hangman's noose thing so maybe my brain was like oh yeah definitely a place what <laughs> it what does hallows mean because uh, like see. isn't halloween technically like all hallows eve and oh, yeah. that doesn't necessarily imply a physical thing does it so hallow is it like something to do with a soul well according to miriam webster the noun version of hallow is a saint or a holy person. Okay. I guess that makes sense because they're almost saint-like objects in that they conquer death, so to speak. Yeah. Well, they're made from the angel of death, I guess. Yeah. I mean, they don't call him the angel of death. They just call no. him death. Death. But essentially. Yeah. I also think it just sounds cool. Oh, and they're the yeah, deathly well, death. hallows. Yeah. So deathly they're... death. No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess they're just like the holy holy objects that conquer death but it's not even holy i don't know mm-hmm. it's always confusing with wizards and religion oh i know oh well so i want to point out yeah they don't know what it means and you implied like the quest and that's what hermione had implied the previous chapter i was like maybe dumbledore didn't tell you because it's a you have to find it out for yourself mm. and xenophilius kind of confirms that when he says One simply uses the symbol to reveal oneself to other believers in the hope that they might help one with the quest. Right. So she was right. And and that was that point Ron was like, yeah, you're right. And Hermione's like, no, I'm not. This is a crazy theory. (laughs) Classic Hermione. She's right even when she isn't trying to be. Exactly. She was just saying that to get Harry to go. And now it's like, oh, wait, she was still right because she's always right (laughs) because she's Hermione. Because she's Hermione Granger. (laughs) So Hermione asks what they are. And Xenophilia says that he assumes they're familiar with the tale of the three brothers. And I am not. And neither is Harry. But Hermione and Ron are. And I realize at this point, oh, it's got to be in Beetle the Bard. And it turns out that it is. It's one of the stories in this book. When Hermione says that she has a copy, Xenophilius really quickly asks, is it the original? Which is intriguing to make it seem like in a later edition of this book they would remove this story or alter this story they never really address Hmm. it but i wonder what happened that there's another version of it that's really true Hmm. yeah and i wasn't sure too if like when he saw it he was like "Ooh, the original and i was like is that like the original copy that she has because like Mm. I would not put it past Dumbledore to literally have, like, the first edition of this book if he was, like, so... He's Dumbledore. I mean, oh, he's like... he's old. He's really old. Well, yeah. First of all, he's really old, but you learn that, like, these are, like, way older than Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah. But he's also, like, he's an academic, and I could totally see him collecting stuff like that, you know? Yeah, I could see if it, If I was Dumbledore, I'd be really into it first edition books (laughs) (laughs) yeah i could see it and at least it would make sense for him to have the original edition of it not necessarily if it's just the first one or just the non-edited version because he is one of these believers or at least he was so you would want to have the right story right this is dumbledore's book yeah i would think he would consider maybe having the original story as like a part of the quest in a way it's like Mm -hmm. if you're finding a treasure it would be way cooler if you had the original map than just like a photocopy (laughs) (laughs) that makes sense yeah because then what if it turns into national treasure and you have to use like lemon juice on the back and there's some (laughs) other secret clip (laughs) i was literally just gonna make that joke but then i was like wait but that wasn't a map that was the declaration of independence but it did have a map after they used the lemon juice yes wow (laughs) 
And we are definitely siblings. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being a kid and watching that movie and be like, this movie's great. Oh. In retrospect, that's probably the dumbest movie. I love that movie. I mean, sure, but it's like, what if we took Mission Impossible, but it was American history based and it starred Nicolas Cage, Cage instead? I kind of like hate that I love that movie because I don't really like <laughs> Nicolas Cage, but I think I love it so much because I used to live in Philadelphia. Mm. So I see all these places and I'm like, oh my God, that's seriously right next to where I used to work. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait, my house is right there. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly have not seen it since I saw it in theaters. I have not watched it a second time. Well, you should probably rewatch it. But like, I don't think you'll get as excited about all the Philly landmarks as I did slash do no i don't care about <laughs> philly but i do don't have a fun time I, I don't i live in new york now so i have even more reason to not give a crap about philly no philly is so underrated <laughs> living in philly made me not want to live in new york because not to like put a damper on new york obviously you just move there and it's spoken awesome. like a true person that doesn't live in new york well no listen <laughs> it philly is like it's a smaller city so it's like you can completely feel like you've done the whole city living there a few years it's like new york you're never gonna feel like you did all of manhattan there's always gonna be like crazy shit you haven't been to there's always gonna be some new restaurant that you were never able to get to it's like i feel like there are a few places in philly that i hadn't gone but like i went to all the cool spots in philly and i feel like i really lived as good of a city life there as possible does that make sense? Yeah, just come visit me in New York and we'll have way more fun. Well, I'm not saying New York <laughs> isn't fun. I'm just saying like, <laughs> I'm saying like the smaller city vibe. Like I got the same feeling when we visited D.C. Mm -hmm. It's just like a more manageable city where it's like you can really feel like, you know, if somebody visited me when I lived in Philly and asked me where something random was, I was able to like off the top of my head tell them the exact street address just because I knew where everything was. <laughs> sure. yeah, and you yeah. can't I possibly do that with Manhattan. <laughs> no, New York is definitely overwhelming. Yeah. But you just got to get to a point where you like narrow your vision. And when people say uh, totally, that that's something's what I'm in saying. Brooklyn, you say, oh, no, we're not going. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you can, you're going to get the same feeling I did with like the entire city of Philly. That's the feeling you're going to get from like Hell's Kitchen. Just and, my neighborhood. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I love my neighborhood. It's very fun, except no. when I have to walk through Times Square, which is the bane of my existence. Oh my God, yeah. And I hate tourists with all of my soul. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone leave. Everyone leave me alone. They never the will. Thing with Times Square is people like <laughs> walk through and they're like, oh my gosh, look at these giant advertisements. It's like they're giant advertisements. Don't you hate <laughs> commercials? These are giant commercials. Don't look at them. What are you doing? But it's a really big screen. It's not cool. There's so many other cool things in this city. And let's take pictures of all the cool big screens. Like, what are you going to do with a picture of that? Walk <laughs> a couple blocks north and go to Central Park, which is actually cool yes. and amazing and gorgeous and natural beauty. Don't take pictures of a giant rectangle. No. It's a big rectangle. Who cares? I mean, I love rectangles, especially big ones. Yeah, but not but. corporate <laughs> rectangles. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, so anyway, Harry Potter. Oh, yeah, right. Forgot about that. So Xenophilus asks Harry to read the story. And does he ask Harry or Hermione to read the story? Hermione reads the story because she gets all pissy when Ron interrupts her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> You do you, girl. <laughs> so Xenophilus asks Hermione to read the story. The story is about three brothers traveling on a winding road at twilight. And this is where Ron interrupts and says, Mom always said midnight to make it spookier. And Hermione's like, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, because it's cooler if it's scarier. Yeah, and Harry's like, yeah, we really need things to be scarier right now. Like yeah. a sassy mf -er. <laughs> So the brothers reach a river that is too deep and too dangerous to cross. So they use magic to make a bridge across. And that bridge led to Terabithia. Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, they get halfway across and they are blocked by a hooded figure, which is Death, who speaks to them. And Death was very angry that he was cheated out of three new victims since travelers usually drown trying to cross this river. And I've brought up in a previous episode of Potter so that J.K. Rowling just blatantly ripped off Space Jam. Uh, didn't know that she also blatantly ripped off Final Destination. What the heck, J.K.? <laughs> Final Destination 1 came out in 2000. This book came out in 2007. 
She can't keep getting away with this. This book came out in 2007. Oh, yeah, yeah. this is the seventh book. Oops. Mm-hmm. Seven years after Final Destination came out. I bet oh there were already like gosh. 12 Final Destination movies out. Do you out. think she really <laughs> watched that, though? I mean, she is British. She doesn't like keep up with American pop culture. Well, clearly not because she doesn't know how sports work. <laughs> I mean, they have sports there. They have sports that are not American sports. They're yeah, but what are they good at? They're like kind of good okay, at soccer like, and then cricket. Yes. That's it. You no, know, what about rugby? Are they good at rugby? Isn't that? Uh, no, like, yeah, but other countries or, are way better. Like Ireland and New Zealand are way better. Well, yeah, I mean, like Australia and New Zealand are like really good. But mm-hmm. all right, spicy past Mike. Just take a second, have a glass of milk. Hey, how's it going? It's me, editing Mike. I want to specifically address the UK listeners out there. I'm not trying to bash you. I love you guys. I don't mean any harm when i talk with my sister i just get particularly sassy if you've been listening i've dunked on the entire city of philadelphia as well as many other things i don't mean to say that you're not good at sports or that you don't have good sports it's all in good fun i'm just making some jokes i know that recently i've been a bit hard on the uk whether it comes to food or past the parcel being a silly name for a game or what have you but i love you all and i just want you to know that i make fun of things that i like And I like all of you, and you're all wonderful. It's not serious. I don't actually dislike you. I'm not trying to bash you. It's all in good fun. Anyway, let's get back to that British-hating loser past Mike. I don't know. Mike, soccer's <laughs> really good. No, I soccer like is soccer. good. You know, I love soccer a lot. Travis has recently gotten like way more into soccer, and I like it because he used to be... I mean, he still is really into football. The but worst like, sport. Oh, my God. It's the worst <sighs> sport. <laughs> the clock just keeps stopping, and it's mm-hmm. like, oh, there's only five minutes left in the game. Oh, that took a fucking hour no, to watch I am on board five with minutes in the game because there's like 20 timeouts and all this <laughs> crap and like soccer just keeps going it just keeps yeah. going and then if oh, there's too the many best. times they call the whistle they just like add five minutes to the end and you're like this is genius <laughs> it's amazing i mean as we were recording this i'm wearing a paris saint germain shirt <laughs> like yes. when i lived in france i went to those games all the time because they're great you go in 45 minute half 15 minute halftime 45 minute half you're gone you're done yeah. it takes like two you're hours like, it's a oh beautiful gosh. experience <laughs> exactly how long the game takes unless yeah. there's overtime and then it's like 15 more minutes because mm-hmm. they don't even do a shootout in regular season anyway right? yeah we're deep diving into <laughs> side so many different things here. so many different things but i get that she didn't really rip off the final destination series but i thought this was what's yeah. going to happen and it only kind of happened so death pretends to congratulate them on their magic saying that they've each earned a prize the oldest brother asked for and a the wand. dumbest oh yes the <laughs> <laughs> the oldest slash dumbest brother asked for a wand more powerful than any in existence, one that could win any duel and one that is worthy of a wizard who had conquered death. Okay. And way to be like super effing specific about your wish. Like he's already <laughs> thought long and hard about this. Like, he really if I has. have one wish. <laughs> to be fair, if you've ever seen genies in other media, they always try to loophole you. Oh, unless it's the genie from Aladdin. There's always like nitpicky things is the joke of it. So I understand trying to over stipulate to make sure he doesn't get screwed. But yes, it's very specific and it seems like something he's very much thought of. Yeah. If I ever run into a genie, <laughs> I mean, I get it too. I'm just like, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a bit okay. much. Okay, okay, God. Yeah. But- okay. And talk. I get it. <laughs> Antioch. <laughs> Antioch. Whatever. <laughs> so this has made me realize something about Voldemort and what he's up to. So this is what I've gathered just based on this piece of the story alone. That Voldemort has heard the story and believes it to be true. And Grindelwald apparently had obtained this big, bad, magical, evil wand. Grigorovich might know of its whereabouts, which is why Voldemort ask Grigorovich where it is, and then there was the whole Grindelwald stole it thing or whatever. And Voldemort wants to take this wand so that he can use it in a duel against Harry and then not lose. So that's what I've gathered based off of this story and what we know about the rest of the Deathly Hallows, Conquering Death, etc., etc. Well, only time will tell. Only time will tell. Actually, all of your questions will be answered next chapter, which Ooh. I also get to talk to you about. So Good. that's kind of cool. Fun, fun, fun. <laughs> so death makes a wand from the branch of a nearby elder tree. And that is the creation of the elder wand. The elder wand. The second brother asks for the power to recall the dead from death. Death gives him a stone and 
says that it has the power. And the third brother asks for porridge that was just right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he actually asks for something that would keep him safe from death. Following him from this place, he gets a cloak of invisibility, which I find to be very interesting and we will learn is very interesting next. Well, he cut it from his own cloth, actually. Oh, I didn't know that. He cuts a piece of his own cloth of invisibility. Oh, the death does, death yes. Does, right, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. So then the brothers cross the rest of the bridge and they separate. The wand bro sought out a wizard with whom he had a quarrel, challenged him to a duel, murdered him. Then he went to an inn to brag about the wand and then he got drunk off a of wine and fell asleep and another wizard stole the wand from him and then, quote, slit his throat for good measure. <laughs> And why he's the dumbest. Yep, this is why he is dumb. The stone bro went to his home and used the stone to recall the girl that he hoped to marry before her untimely death. But she was sad and cold and felt as though she was separated by a veil because she didn't belong in the real world. So then what did he do? He killed himself out of sadness so that he could be with her forever and truly, a.k.a. the Romeo and Juliet method. So death took the second brother. Mm -hmm. I have have to say though it says he turned the stone thrice in hand mm -hmm. and like death didn't tell him to do that how the fuck did he know to do that i'm just he... like mm, probably three times <laughs> i don't know <laughs> like, feels like fuck? an important number yeah <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he just kept turning. Maybe he was just like accidentally like, turning nope, in his hand. Nope, not yet. Oh, there we oh, go. Ah. There <laughs> what if he just like shook it or like threw it on the ground? Like how is he supposed to know yeah. this? What they left out of the story was him for weeks trying to activate it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's tried yelling at the stone, tossing the stone, burying the stone. <laughs> Oh, finally. <laughs> so, Thrice in hand. <laughs> so Death tried to find the third brother, but he couldn't until he was very old and finally took off the cloak and gave it to his son. And at this point, I wonder, is this son James Potter? And <laughs> greeted Death like an old friend and went willingly. We later learned that this dude's last name is not Potter, so he must be a lot older than James Potter. But I don't know if this is the exact cloak but we do get into a situation where we learn that james potter's cloak is very special because it's not just your run-of-the-mill invisibility cloak <laughs> so he gave this cloak to his son and then greeted death like an old friend and went willingly as equals into death and that's the end of the story mm -hmm. xenophilius then says well there you are those are the deathly hallows and they're all like wait what that was just a story about three dudes and some <laughs> magical shit. <laughs> so he then goes on to clarify that in the logo, the Elder Wand is the vertical line, the Resurrection Stone is the circle, and the Cloak of Invisibility is a triangle. And I was a little upset about this because, like, the cloak is a triangle? I don't know. Uh. Well, yeah, it's like the hood and then, like, I guess, it kind of, yeah. like, flows out. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, like... We're taking it in its simplest forms here. This is symbolic. Yes, it is a very good logo. It looks very cool. And I was super wrong about what the Deathly Hallows were. So <laughs> we're right back on track. Ride it's my some high. some place on a mountain <laughs> that's split in half. No. <laughs> uh, I was riding the high off of guessing Rose Murta being evil. And now I'm right back in Ludo Bagman Village. <laughs> Up uh, past Mike. Don't make me put you in time out. You have to leave time in the episode for Wingardium Adridosa. Also, just to clarify, I say Wingardium Ad Reed Osa. Like an Ad Reed and Wingardium Leviosa, you know the Harry Potter thing. It's a joke. It's fun. I've had people leave one star reviews for Potterless because they don't know what I say. It's Wingardium Ad Reed Osa. Anyway, now it's time for Wingardium at Ridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by HelloFresh. Let's say, hypothetically, you are on this very prolonged camping trip with your two best friends, and you're really hungry, and you try to get some food, but the only food that you can get is like some eggs and a loaf of bread that you have to steal. Wouldn't it be so much better if someone delivered fresh ingredients to your door so that you could cook a healthy and affordable meal that tastes incredible? Well, that's where HelloFresh comes in because they allow you to do just that. HelloFresh gives you seasonal simple recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door, better than just some random bread you stole from a farmer. And HelloFresh makes cooking easy and 
enjoyable because all meals come together in 30 minutes max. They call for less than two pots and pans and they require minimal cleanup, which is good when you're on the run and you can't spend all this time cleaning dishes, ugh. And HelloFresh has a ton of different options depending on what you're going for. They have dinner to lunch, 20 minute meals, gourmet, one pot wonders, and you lovely people can get $80 off your first month of HelloFresh if you go to hellofresh.com slash potterless80 and enter code potterless80 at checkout. In my most recent box, I made some chicken pineapple quesadillas and yo, these quesadillas slapped. I'm usually not a big quesadilla fan, but these were amazing and fresh. I thoroughly enjoyed them and I cannot wait to make them a staple in my recipe making because I have the recipe card forever. Again, if you want to get $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, you can go to hellofresh.com slash potterless80 and enter code potterless80 at checkout and cook some amazing food that's better than stealing bread today. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Wix. Let's say you just graduated from school after defeating Satan, and it's like the mid-2000s, and you want to establish your business as the best herbologist in the country, but you need a way to get your name out there. Well, what better way than to utilize the internet, and what better way to showcase all these amazing plants than with a website of your own? That's where Wix can come in, and Wix can also hook you up with the domain name to go along with this website so that you can make something... I don't know, like NevilleLongbot.com, since your name is Neville Longbottom. You know, NevilleLongbot.com. You can make your website with Wix with over 400 templates that make it easy and simple to design something that you love. And with Wix, you can take as much time as you need to design a website, try it all out, and then if you want to upgrade to one of their premium packages, you can get a whole bunch of new features. And as a Potterless listener, you can get 10% off a premium membership if you go to Potterless Podcast dot com slash Wix and then click the link for the promo. Kelly built the Potterless website using Wix. Kelly built the horse website using Wix. And Wix has now given me the chance to make my own site on my own to prove that even a simpleton can do it. I'm going to make a portfolio site with Wix and I'll have an update for the next time they sponsor an episode about how it went. But from poking around a little bit that I've done so far, it is so easy and intuitive. Even if you have no experience at all making a website, you can make something that's absolutely gorgeous. And I'm excited when I finish finish this to let you all see that I even could figure it out. So again, if you go to potterlesspodcast.com slash Wix, you can get 10% off when you upgrade to Wix Premium and you can go and make your own website and be the best herbologist with the best website in the world today. So Hermione brings up that the name isn't mentioned in the story and Xenophilius is super smug and explains that the children's story isn't meant to instruct, but those who study know that if you possess those three objects, you have the power to be the master of death. Hermione asks if Xenophilius thinks that these actually exist, and he says, well, of course. Hermione is in disbelief, though, and Xenophilius calls her close-minded. Ron suggests her trying on the hat, the <laughs> thing that was on the bust of Ravenclaw, and he is, quote, fighting back laughter while he says this, which is fantastic. <laughs> You're still on thin ice with Hermione. Let's not make jokes like that. Yeah, dude, you gotta wait a little bit longer before you can do this. Xenophilius clarifies that the cloak is one that truly renders the wearer invisible and he goes on to list these not as great invisibility cloaks and at first when he's talking about it my first thought was is harry's not this really good one and then the squad all kind of make eye contact to realize he's basically talking about harry's cloak <laughs> so <laughs> they all just don't say anything but they realize xenophilius is saying oh it's not like something that has just a a charm on it or a camouflaging charm or whatever it's truly invisible and they're all <laughs> and the squad all just starts thinking uh yeah yeah we know how they work <laughs> yeah we yeah. don't have some <laughs> knockoff invisibility cloak we get the real deal dude get off our yeah. back yeah they're all like oh wait is this special <laughs> <laughs> So Hermione then asks how the stone could be real. And Xenophilia says, prove it doesn't exist, which is the worst type of argument ever. Yeah, Hermione cannot wrap her head around that for sure. Yeah, it's... No, uh, no, 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 nobody. Yeah, this is not how <laughs> debate works. I don't yeah. know if you've ever done Lincoln-Douglas debate, but you can't do that. <laughs> this is not real. People cannot come back from the dead. I do not believe this story. She's like, this is where it falls flat for me. Even if she knows about the cloak and even if like she's on board with the possibility of a powerful wand, she cannot wrap her head around the stone. <laughs> 
<laughs> so Harry asks about the Elder Wand, and Xenophilia says that there is a bunch of evidence for that because of the way that it is passed from one hand to another. It must be captured from its previous owner, so basically people just keep trying to kill other people to get this wand, and that is the circle of life of it existing. Well... Yeah, kind of. Or people yeah. steal it from it or people – basically what happens is people get the wand and then they brag about having the wand and then someone finds out that they have the wand and then they do whatever they can to take that wand away from the person. Yeah, yeah. Harry asks where Xenophilius thinks it is now and he isn't sure. Hermione asks if the Peverell family has anything to do with the Deathly Hallows and Harry thinks this name sounds familiar but he can't put his finger on it. Xenophilius says yes. And Ron thankfully asks who they are because the normal reader didn't realize that they were the name on that grave that they saw a couple <laughs> chapters ago. So Where the symbol was. Yeah. yeah, so thanks Ron for bringing that up. Xenophilius says that that grave is proof that the three brothers in the story were the three Peverell brothers, Antioch, Cadmus, and Ignotus, which are the oldest sounding names that you can come up with ever. Good job, J.K. Rowling. Right. And it was it was Ignotus on the grave. Yes. Okay. And he was the cloak one, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because he would be normally buried since he willingly went to death, not like suicide bro or slit throat bro. True, but like... Don't spoil anything. <laughs> well, no, I'm not spoiling anything. You okay. already kind of know. Like, you just have to think about, like, you know, they're talking about the cloak, obviously. Mm-hmm. Oh, it would make sense because if it's in Godric's Hollow, maybe that is how James got it because it's in the same town as where James Potter grew up. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Uh. But we don't know that to be true. Sure, sure, but sure. But sure. the location is, you know, it makes sense. It's relevant and it is important. So Xenophilius tells them to stay for dinner as they have a plimpy soup recipe that everyone asks about. And Ron says, probably to inform the poison department of the Ministry of Magic, <laughs> which <laughs> is great. Hermione still thinks that the whole story is rubbish and Ron does too. Ron then reveals that Elder Wands being unlucky is a wizard superstition. And then he rattles off a bunch of superstitions. And you mentioned to me earlier that you wanted to talk about them. So do you want to read these superstitions? Well, it wasn't that. It was that the prior chapter, Ron goes, all is fair in love and war. Oh, which, yeah. Then he knows muggle ones, too. Yeah. And you're just like, wait a minute. And then he knows all these. Like, that wasn't necessarily a superstition. It's just like a saying, mm -hmm. you know, from like an old English book. So I don't know. But it's just like, wait a minute, you can't like point out that sayings aren't interchangeable between like regular muggles and wizards and then like make one interchangeable. Yeah. <laughs> like pick a lane, JK, pick a lane. <laughs> what are those superstitions? I don't have my book in front of me. Can you read them? Uh, I feel like one was yeah. really stupid. Mayborn witches will marry muggles. Jinx by twilight, undone by midnight. Wand of elder never prosper. You must have heard of them. My mum's full of them. <laughs> <laughs> and then Hermione's like, Harry and I were raised by muggles, you idiot. We just went over this when you were talking about how we should have known the nursery rhyme. Right? What a weird superstition that if you're born in May, you're going to marry a muggle. That's so strange. I agree. <laughs> also, it doesn't even rhyme, so it doesn't sound cute. It's just like, hey, you have a May birthday, you're going to marry a muggle, idiot. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to spoil anything uh -huh. with like the Fantastic Beasts or whatever, but she never, in Harry Potter anyway, she never really gets into like, what I guess our only reference is like the Dursleys, mm -hmm. but like people that are muggle born, like witches and wizards that are muggle born, it's like, how do their parents deal with it? Like, what do they do? Where do they tell their friends where their kid is going to school? Like, yeah. how is it still a big secret that witches and wizards exist when there's so many like muggle born witches and wizards where it's like, I mean, enough people should know by now. Do you think there are, like, support groups for families that give birth to witches and wizards and they, like, don't know how to deal with it because they're muggles? Or I have no idea, but, like, what, what does Hermione do when she goes to family Christmas I know, that's with what I all saying. of her muggle family? And they're like, what have you been up to? And she's like, uh, uh, knitting? <laughs> like, what do you say? That's why she has to study arithmancy. So it's like she still knows math, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That but seems I mean, really troubling. Yeah, it's just kind of like, do you think there's some kind of protocol for like muggle-born families? 
and the way they raise a rich There has wizard. to be some sort of handbook of like, here's what you should tell muggles. If someone asks about your children's schooling, yeah. <laughs> then you just have to say they go to a vague boarding school. Right. Because obviously, like, Petunia took it poorly, like, being Lily's sister. But Well, she was horse-faced, so, you know. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> How do you keep that a secret? And, like, as a human knowing that witches and wizards exist, like, how do you I don't know this I'm getting like way crazy <laughs> right now <laughs> where I'm going with this I don't even know but it's okay I don't know how I even just thought of this it's not well defined <laughs> you yeah. just gotta grin and bear it yeah Hermione then talks about it being just a morality story about which thing you should choose and then the squad says yeah it's pretty obvious which one you should choose and then they all say a different one at the same time <laughs> Hermione says cloak Ron says wand and Harry says stone they bicker about it for a bit and what I really see is really great. I've been listening to the audiobook for this chapter. Stephen Fry's Ron voice is amazing because he always sounds just like incredulous or like kind of snarky, but in a fun way. Like every time he talks, he's like, oh, Hermione, why are you too like, blah, blah, blah. it's like this like really like dismissive kind of, well, I can't believe this. And it's just a very fun voice for Ron that he's just constantly dismissive of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Hermione goes on to say that the stories about amazing wands pop up all the time, specifically citing that in Professor Binz's history class, he told them stories about the Death Stick and the Wand of Destiny, which are horrible names for the a powerful wand. wand. Of destiny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just makes me think of the Tenacious D movie, The Pick of Destiny. <laughs> I think it's like maybe those people didn't know that it was a Deathly Hollow or whatever, mm -hmm. so they just made up their own name for yeah. it and they're obviously not good at making up names, kind of like Voldemort. Or J.K. Rowling put out yeah. her. <laughs> Harry asks, what if it's always just the Elder Wand, which seems like a possible theory, but who knows? Ron then goes on to ask Harry why he picked the stone, which is not a great question because you should know the answer, Ron. Like, uh, everyone I love is dead except for you two. <laughs> yeah. Harry says we could get back Sirius, Dumbledore, my parents. I mean, clearly Ron has not read the books. No. <laughs> But Harry then realizes that the story says that they wouldn't be happy to be back, so it might not be a good idea to add the stone anyway. Right. Later on, Harry notices an interesting painting on the ceiling of Luna's room in the house. It's five faces, Harry, Ron, Hermione, Ginny, and Neville. And then there's a bunch of gold chains painted around them, which all say friends. And this is so sweet. I, know. I teared up and my heart grew three sizes. Luna Lovegood sweet, is perfect. Sweet Luna. Sweet. She's so Sweet, she yeah. is so wonderful. I know. Harry then notices some interesting things about the room, though, mainly that there is dust on the floor and cobwebs around, making it very much appear as if no one has been in this room for weeks. Great detective work. <laughs> <laughs> Sherlock Potter notices some stuff. So Xenophilius comes back up and Harry just confronts him. Yeah, he's like, what the fuck, dude? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Luna? And before Xenophilius can try to lie, about it, Harry notices that the tray of soup that he brought up only has four bowls in it, which, come on, Xenophilius, if you're <laughs> trying to do this big ruse, get your shit together. <laughs> He's got a lot going on and is clearly, like, not thinking straight. Mm -mm. So he drops the tray and they all start to pull out their wands and then the printing press freaks out and screws up and shoots out a bunch of quibblers and the squad sees that they have the undesirable number one picture with Harry's reward money listed on the cover. Xenophilius then goes on to reveal that the Death Eaters took Luna because of his writing in the Quibbler and he thinks that they'll give her back if he hands them over. Harry Potter. Undesirable number one. Xenophilius says that the Death Eaters will be here any moment and he tries to stop the squad from leaving. People on broomsticks start approaching and then Xenophilius tries to stun the squad, but Harry kind of pushes them all out of the way of it and he hits that big old horn and it explodes and it just turns the house basically into rubble. Poor Luna's mirror. I know. That's the saddest uh, part about it. That really is. It's just, oh man, I hope someone at least took a picture of it or something. I know. So the house is wrecked. The Ravenclaw bust is 
busted. And then the Death Eaters <laughs> enter. It's Selwyn and Travers. And they start smack talking Xenophilius. He fell down the stairs when the explosion went down and he's trapped under rubble. And you learn that Xenophilius had tried to convince the Death Eaters to bring Luna back with all of this information or stuff that wasn't sufficient to them. So when he tries to tell them that, yo, Harry Potter is upstairs, they don't believe him. Mm -hmm. And they think that it's all a trap and that if they go upstairs, it's going to be booby trapped or someone's going to be waiting for him or whatever. So they basically say, if you go upstairs and bring us Harry Potter, maybe we'll talk. So Xenophilius gets out of all the rubble and he goes upstairs and the squad knows that he's coming. So they have to devise a plan. And Hermione says to Harry, do you trust me? And you better say yes. Uh, yeah. Like, how could you not? Like you and Ron, neither of you are going to come up with a plan half as good as what Hermione is about to do. Exactly. So Harry says yes. And he and Hermione go over to to break Ron free because he was trapped under a bunch of rubble. When they do, she asks for the cloak and she says that Ron is going to put it on. She has Harry then grab her hand and tells Ron to grab her shoulder. And when Xenophilius approaches them, she uses Obliviate and Deprimo, which blasts a hole in the floor and it falls through. A bunch of rubble lands on the Death Eaters and then Hermione disapparates and that's the end of the chapter. And that's also the end of this episode of Potterless. So, <laughs> little cliffhangery, but a lot of stuff happened. Meg, how do you feel about these two chapters? Oh my gosh, love these chapters. Tale of the Three Brothers is one of my favorites. Um, and they do like a real cool telling of it in the movie. I mean, they tell it pretty much word for word in the movie. And uh -huh. they do like some cool animation, which I like. Oh, cool. You know, I love a good fairy tale. So the fact that there's like a story within a story is always a good thing. Yeah, it was good. And it was an interesting fairy tale. It seems like an interesting call to put in a children's book because it seems pretty serious. It features death and suicide, like not well, and a throat getting slit. Like I can understand why they maybe made a revised version of Beetle the Bard because this does not seem like a children's story at all. It's very gruesome. Well, I mean, honestly, a lot of fairy tales are more gruesome than you realize. Like in the actual fairy tale of the Little Mermaid, I think the Little Mermaid like does end up dying. She doesn't get kissed. I don't think Ursula is like a real thing. Anyway, and like Cinderella's stepsisters actually like cut off their own toes and heel. Oh, yeah. The real Cinderella is screwed up. Yeah. And what else? I mean, Hansel and Gretel, doesn't the witch like eat them? Probably. Eat the kids or something? Sounds about right. Yeah. They're all actually really dark. <laughs> I mean, I think they were all written in like the Middle Ages when thing times were tough. I, I guess the difference <laughs> is that I know that one of the stories in Beetle the Bard is Babbity Rabbit, <laughs> which seems a lot more lighthearted yeah. than Three Brothers versus Death. True. I don't actually have a copy of Beetle and the Bard and I have not read it. You gave it to me for Christmas last year. I know. And so maybe I can read it by this Christmas if I finish this <laughs> damn book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> finish the book first. I'm so close. I'm getting there. I'm making progress. I'm making my way downtown. I would like to see if the actual, if the symbol of the Deathly Hallows is actually in your book though. Ooh. Well, when we're home for Thanksgiving, <laughs> which is yeah. a couple days after the time of recording, this you can go check it out and i won't look just in case there's any sort of spoiler in it yeah. but megan thank you so much for joining along oh thanks for having me no always good to have you glad to have you back listeners thank you so much for listening well oh what's up i was just gonna say do you have any like more predictions about what might happen oh. you know what are your thoughts on the deathly hollows and like you know um well i kind of i kind of laid out the wand thing so i understand all of that i also think the stone is a bunch of bs slash okay. even if you could get it it doesn't seem worth it because we learned that the one thing it does isn't even good because the person that comes back just hates being back so i kind of hope they just ignore the stone honestly or or if they get the stone at some point they could use it to just like talk to people whether he talks to dumbledore and asks for advice or talks to his parents and gets a pep talk or talks to sirius or something if he brings them back with the thought of not actually having them back in his life like the brother in the story was trying to do like he was trying to have this girl he had a crush on and spend the rest of his life with her right. if you could just like have Dumbledore back or have his parents back just to talk to them for a little bit that would be cool if they go into it knowing that it's a temporary thing but I don't know it seems like they got the cloak 
It seems like Voldemort is after the wand. Yeah, you think that's a for sure thing? I think so. You think the cloak is the one they're talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's an object that we've had in our knowledge throughout the series. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of cool to have the reveal be like, hey, this thing's actually super special, given that the other two things are very new items to learn about. Mm -hmm. It's kind of nice to have something that we're more familiar with actually turn out to be really important. So yeah, I would think that they've got it. And I think that Harry, like if he doesn't, there's the chance that Voldemort can get it. And that's not good because we don't want Voldemort to be able to conquer death. Right. (laughs) So I'll have to see, but my, I basically for each item, I'm guessing that Voldemort is trying to get this wand And I'm guessing that I'm here. I'll even go one step further. I bet Voldemort is going to get the wand and then he's still going to get beat because Hermione keeps saying the wand is only as strong as the wizard. And I think Harry's love is going to conquer the elder wand. It won't even matter. So I don't know how the stone is going to play or if they're going to find it or whatever. But I also think it's the least important of the three items. Fair enough. Okay, so what do you think? is the purpose of them learning about these items. Like, it sounds to me like you're saying they're trying to, like, prevent Voldemort from getting them. Is that your take on it? Or do you have, like, another, like, why? I think the main thing is when you look at the story, it boils down to the cloak is the best item. And yes, you have the morality of it. But I think part of it could be, look, you have the cloak, use it, wisely and clearly it's been saving their asses the entire book okay i think also it's teaching the lesson to harry which you can't really get back those that are gone so don't worry about it that much okay and then also with the wand you see that it's the least important of the items it's the least powerful in terms of people keep getting killed over it and it gets passed from person to person to person. So I think that the point of the story is kind of to teach Harry what is most important and what's most important is the thing that he has and to focus on that and not the other two things, which can be a lot more tempting, but not necessarily more helpful. Interesting. Yeah. So I think it's a very good story for Dumbledore to ensure that they read. And it makes a whole lot more sense because I was kind of on team Ron when Hermione had this book and Ron is freaking out and is upset asking, why the hell did Dumbledore give you this children's book, this collection of children's? It's like he gave him a copy of Aesop's Fables or whatever. But this seems very much not like a children's story. So had I known that something this series was in the book, I would have made more sense. Definitely. Yeah. But I'm excited. I'm excited to see what happens next. And you'll be on the next episode about the next chapter. So uh, you won't have to wait too long for us to talk about it some more. Yes. Wait, so are you a believer in these items? Are you like Hermione where you're like, I think Two out of three are real. Yeah, I think the stone is a bit much. Okay. But I definitely believe in the other two. So I could see it. But I also could believe that like the Elder Wand isn't necessarily one item, but just a specific type of wand or something like that. Like there's several of them or something. Yeah, or something where it's just like people are gravitated towards powerful wands in general and they try to steal them off each other. Not necessarily that it is the one wand from the story kind of thing. Okay. But yeah, the one thing I'm hesitant towards is the stone. You're Hermione. Good. She's the best. So <laughs> I'm in good company. Oh, I forgot to tell you too. My, um, well, you gave her that little Hermione doll. You gave her Ador- Aurora. Yeah. You're a yes. adorable daughter. My cute baby niece. Yes. The little Hermione doll, and she loves castles. And I was rewatching the movies before us recording, and I had the DVD of Harry Potter sitting out, and it has Hogwarts on it. <laughs> and she started pointing out that she goes, Castle, Kaka, which is castle. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh, that's Hermione's castle. Nice. <laughs> so yep. Today, I mean, it basically is. Let's be honest. This morning, she starts pointing at it. And she goes, "My niece, cat, cat." Yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but so, my daughter thinks Hogwarts is Hermione's castle. I mean, yeah. to be honest, <laughs> she's not wrong. <laughs> she is not wrong. Smart baby, real smart baby. 
<laughs> well, Megan, thank you so much for joining. And listeners, well, thank, thank you. thank you for having oh, me. Oh, my pleasure. The pleasure is all mine. And listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, before they read their children scary ass stories before they go to bed. <laughs> Wizard on! <laughs> You heard me talk about Multitude in the beginning of the show. If you don't know what that is, it's an audio collective that I'm a part of. It's a whole bunch of amazing podcasts focused on people nerding out about the things they love. That's Potterless, that's Horse, my other podcast. Join the party, Spirits, and Waystation. If you want more information on those shows, you can head on over to Multitude.Productions. We also have resources about how to start a podcast of your own if you're interested in that. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Leon Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Clark. Lobichard, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Lopu, Rebecca Adamek, Frank Giotto, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfilio, Jenna Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Abid Med, Caitlin Jordan Pontolo, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Belay, Marie Lisa C. Keen, Ariel Bird, Romina Rivadanier, Camille Dock, Russell Dunk, Dustin Wellen Cooch, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Ross Ann Batamana, Andrea Franz, Nikita Power, Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Love Cash Longer, Ali Madsen, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Amelia Kraus, Sean Montag, Sarah Ning, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Jessica Ann Arnica, the daughter, Tiago Costa, Daisy Carton Sutter, Jessica Jacob, Orchid Grover, Steve Trillor, Vivian the Owl, Takari Ron, Haley Hastings, Marino, Muster, Pinkie Pan, Angelina Withrid, Ross Marie Heise, Lee Ganji Singh, Alex Basholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Finn Stucky, Mosin Siddiqui, Grace Riggle, Sammy Shaw, Raul Pineda, Ingen Oddstadter, Mari Wynn, Brianne Wingate, Alexandra Consilver, John Cocker, Jen and Juice, Noel Basile, Tao, Emily Tyrell, Michael Russell, Robin Fernandez, Patricio Colon, Will Barrington, Liz Bigelow, Mariah Noah, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Enslin, Claire Spencer, TLC, Nick Schutzberg, Rory Collier, Glory Gillum, Sarah and Patrick Donovan, Alicat29, Hallie Bowen, Veronica Bartova, Kevin Harnoy, Lada B, Noah Tracy Toya, Lucinda, Carlos Nino, Pam Webb, Nikki Amio, Colleen King, Jennifer Mark, Clue, Free DJ Svedson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Tyler Latshaw, Summer Raffle, Heather Fleischman, Vera Cullithan, Carrie D. Bagson, Andrea Crock, Elisa Grieven, Lynn Walker, Emily Gale, Ryan King, Cameron Watkins, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Paris, Toothless Walnut, Weekend at Dead Cat Ladies, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Kimberly Savage, Surgeon Thon Megupta, Brittany Gutierrez, Nita Atabani, Bavi Patel, Tumnus Moran, Remy Fontaine, Mats Furley, Sarah Shecker, Lauren Cook, Nova VM, Kyle, Zena Rosnowski, Emily Tilly, Colleen Mage, Harlan Haskins, Akonkshis Oxena, Wouter Vander Maiden, Shelby Darnell, Noelia, Reese Clark, Adriana Cox, Brian, Yukum Beats Waffles, Wash and Large, Jenny Campione, Nikki Harris, Kara Hamilton, Dorcas, Courtney Hemwood, Kine Roan, Amanda Alfred, Sabrina, and Can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campomanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can go to facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, instagram.com slash potterless podcast, or reddit.com slash r slash potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can head on over to potterlesspodcast.com. And if you want bonus content, go to patreon.com slash potterless. Thank you so much for listening. Please tell your friends about the podcast if you haven't already. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on! <laughs>